Hallelujah and glory to God. I tell you, I love to teach about healing and I love to, he to teach about the miracle power of God. And I want to tell you two other real exciting things uh, today. In, in other words, two other different ways to heal the sick. Some of these may be a little bit new to you and a little bit different, but I think that they'll just be super exciting. Okay, we're going to be teaching from chapter 10, Healing Through Intercessory Prayer. And uh, that's on page 108 in your book, How to Heal the Sick. Now, y'all remember the story in Matthew 8 where the centurion said to Jesus, speak the word only and my servant will be healed. People are healed the same way today. You can speak the word here and they will be healed thousands of miles away. To me, that's one of the most wonderful things about God that we have to remember at all times. God is sovereign. Don't ever forget that when you're healing the sick, God is sovereign. God can do it any way he wants to. Just when you think you got everything down real pat and you think, oh boy, God's going to, this is the way he does this, 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 this. Then he just shows you that he's sovereign and he can do it any way that he wants to. But healing through intercessory prayer is a tremendous way for people to be healed. Now there are two kinds of intercessory prayers and I want to show you one kind and then I want to show you a second kind. The first kind is the uh, intercessory prayer where you are specifically called for intercessory prayer. Now not everybody is called for intercessory prayer. How many of you know that? As a matter of fact, we are blessed here at the City of Light. We have some tremendous uh, people who are intercessory prayer warriors. And unless you are specifically called to be an intercessory prayer warrior, you will never understand intercessory prayer. We are blessed in this church to have Faith Selman, an outstanding intercessory prayer warrior. I remember when uh, Faye came to me the first time and uh, she began telling me some of the things that, that God had revealed to her concerning our ministry and concerning us. And she said, as a matter of fact, I was going out the door yesterday and uh, to the store because I urgently needed to get some things. And she said, as I hit the front step, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, pray for Francis right now. Now this is very interesting because God called her to pray for me. Most people pray for the two of us together, but God laid upon her a specific uh, desire to pray for me. And she said, I went back in the house and I laid on the bed and she said, I travailed in the spirit. And she said, I cried and I moaned and I groaned for you for some two or three hours. And I said, you did? Because I thought, What's she doing groaning? You know, I thought, I didn't really understand intercessory prayer. And as I say, I don't believe that any of us really understand it unless we are especially called to be an intercessory prayer warrior. But uh, as I have gone on, now this was several years ago that Faye told me that. As I have gone on, I have gone on to understand and appreciate what is really happening. Because as I thought back upon that afternoon, we were making a tremendous decision concerning hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in our mind, there was a question, there was discussion. Do we do it this way? Do we do it this way? Do we step out in faith and do this? And so forth and so on. And you see what God had said to her? God said, look, Francis needs some undergirding because this is a big decision. The devil is getting in there and he's trying to throw confusion in one way or another. But as she lifted us up in prayer and she was interceding for us with her mind, her heart, her body, and our soul, the, the word of God and the word from God's Holy Spirit came into us and we made the right decision. Now, there are many ministries today who are hiring intercessory prayer warriors. Now, let me show you. They get paid a salary. How many of you would like to be paid to pray? Now, you might think the same thing as I thought. Oh, well, that's sacrilegious. 
Who would accept money to pray? Well, now I want to show you why it's smart when a ministry can afford it. And sometimes I wonder if they can afford not to have one. Let me show you something. If I said to you, would you pray for me eight hours a day? What would you say? Now, I want you to be honest. I don't want you to be spiritual. I want you to be honest. She would say, that would be very difficult for me to find eight hours to pray for you. Now, I might say, why would it be difficult? All right. Now, did you hear what she said? It would be difficult for me to pray for you because of my family obligations, but I would be glad to pray for you one hour a day. Now, I can understand that. I can understand when you have children, you cannot sit and pray eight uninterrupted hours for me, can you? Can you imagine the condition of your house if you did? Ooh, if you have children, I can just see them having a ball. Oh boy, mama's praying, we can't interrupt her. Oh boy, <laughs> let's throw a football at all the lights in the house. Oh, let's get the lipstick out. Let's get the mayonnaise out and paint the bedspread with it. Oh, glory, can't we have fun? Mama's praying and we can't interrupt her. All right, now, she's being totally honest. All right, now I'm going to turn the situation around, and I'm going to show you why. If I said to you, all right, now I'm, I'm going to assume that you're a widow, and you don't have any money, and you're really in a desperate situation, and you're looking for a job, and you can't find a job, and supposing I came up to you and said, would you like a job in our office, and we'll pay you $2 an hour more than you get paid in the standard job. Would you like to come and work for us? What would you say? She'd say, yes. And then the next thing she'd say is, what kind of a job is it? I'd say praying eight hours a day. Now, do you see the difference? You see, if it's on a volunteer basis, it would be very hard to pray eight hours a day. Amen? How many of you know that there's no way on a volunteer basis that you'd pray eight hours a day? You're right. If you don't raise your hand, you're telling a fib. All right. Now, but if it's your job, you'll be there every day, won't you? Right? Because you are conscientious on a job. So you'll be there every day, and if your job is praying, what are you going to do? Pray. Did anybody ever tell you how interesting that could be to just pray? Woo, wow. Can you just imagine that? I think that would be really neat. All right. Now, do you have any idea how you would grow in the Lord? All right, because you pray the word over all the situations. You say, Father, today that uh, they've asked me to really pray for finances. So, Father, I'm going to stand on Luke 6, 38, which says, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running all over the place, shall men give unto your bosom. Father, this ministry has given over and over again. Now I ask you, Father, I call into being this verse of Scripture right now for the finances of this ministry. Maybe somebody in the ministry is not feeling well. You say, Father, your word says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Father, your word says. You see what you're doing? You're just quoting the word over the situation all the time. A tremendous way to grow in the Lord is to become a paid intercessory prayer warrior. Many of the big, many of the big ministries in America today have intercessory prayer warriors 24 hours a day. They have three eight-hour shifts, and all those people do is they pray around the clock for the ministry. No wonder certain ministries are growing so big because they are really undergirded with some tremendous amounts of prayer. Now that's one kind. Uh, let me just ask you, because there, I know that there are never too many. There are always more in a Bible college or a school of ministry as this. But how many of you in your heart feel a compassion to become an intercessory prayer warrior? Just from the little bit that I've said. And don't feel like you're spiritual raising your hand. Don't feel like you're unspiritual not raising your hand. But I just want to see if in here we have some people who would like to be an intercessory prayer warrior. 
Okay, I see hands, I see hands going up all the place. That's really good. All right, I want you to continue to listen to God because what God may start you in is just what you said to me. I can't pray for you eight hours a day, but I'll pray for you one hour a day. Now that's the way most intercessory prayer warriors start. As you start that way, then you will see that God will begin to open your mind and you will get spirit revelation that will enable you to even save someone's life in the ministry that you're praying for. Because as God gave uh, Joseph a warning in a dream, God also gives intercessory prayer warriors warnings in dreams as they pray the word to, so that they will give advice to the ministry they're praying for. Intercessory prayer warriors are really tremendously invaluable. You have to have a real desire though to be one, or as I say, you will never understand real intercessory uh, prayer. We had a girl that came to our first year of the School of Ministry. We took her over to Louisiana with us on a trip and uh, she met an intercessory prayer warrior over there. And she went, she did not come to any of the services, but what she did, she prayed with the intercessory prayer warriors in this church, and God called her to be an intercessory prayer warrior in Africa. Now, isn't that exciting? I mean, it was really interesting, but as she came in contact with it, an area where she had never realized before, she saw that there was tremendous power in intercessory prayer. Now, there is another kind of intercessory prayer that we can all do that isn't quite as let's say tedious as that. I think it'd be fun though. I think it would be just fun. Just imagine just sitting there all day long with a Bible, opening it up, one scripture after another one. And the more that you quote the word of God and the more you hear the word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many of you know what happens to your faith before long? Oh, I tell you, your faith would just really rise up. All right. Uh, Jesus told the centurion, he said, that when the centurion said, speak the word only and thy servant will be healed, in Matthew 8, 13, it said, he said, go thy way and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed at that self same hour. In intercessory prayer of the kind I'm going to be speaking about right now, you pray the word, you speak the word, and the miracle occurs on the other end. When I first, right after I first received the baptism with the Holy Spirit, I had an invitation down to a church uh, way, oh, I'd probably 75 miles away from Houston, and it was in an Episcopalian church where they did not believe at that time in the baptism with the Holy Spirit and in the gifts of the Spirit. And so I gave a talk which uh, I would give in any denomination, and that's how to make the Word of God come alive in your life. And then when I finished the meeting, I stopped just for a few moments and I said, now I'd like to tell you what's going on in the world today. I said, I'd like to give you just a little sample of what is happening in the charismatic world. And I began to tell about some of the healings that had taken place in our ministry. And I began to tell about people falling out under the power of God. And I had dismissed the service, so I felt free to do this. And so when I ended up, I said, now, if there are any of you that would like for me to lay hands on you, I said, I will be more than happy to. The first one that came up to me was uh, a young lady and she said, a friend of mine is dying today. She's in the hospital in Galveston. And she said, um, uh, I called this morning and uh, a friend who is a nurse there said that she is not expected to live through the day. She is in intensive care. She had been in a coma for quite a while. She said, do you think that God would heal her if we agreed here? And I said the words that I want you to remember, and I've told you why before, what have you got to lose? You have nothing to lose. That's why I pray for the most impossible situations because you have nothing to lose when you pray. You have absolutely nothing to lose. And so I grabbed her hands. Of course, eager beaver, yes, yes, yes. I just believe you and God will do a miracle. So I grabbed her hands. And when I grabbed her hands and said, Father, I thought, I don't even know anything about this girl. I don't know what her name is. As, as a matter of fact, I did not know that she had cancer. I take that back. She said to me that she was dying. So I said, Father, I don't even know who she is. I don't know what room she's in. I don't know anything about her. I don't even know her name. But I said, Father, you do. So I said, Father, I just ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit to go to this girl, to go to that room and heal her in Jesus' name. And I said, Father, we just give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now it's interesting, there are many times we never hear what's going on until months and months later. Sometimes we don't even hear from people from years. I was walking down an aisle one time, I believe it was in Des Moines, Iowa, and there was a lady sitting there that had cancer of the tongue. I didn't know it. I just walked down the aisle. And as I walked down the aisle, I just went Boo! on the top of her head because the Lord just told me to lay my hand on her. So I just laid my hands on her, didn't pray, just laid my hands on her. Seven years later, we were back in the same city, and she said, oh, I've been meaning to write you for seven years, but I haven't had time. I think you've really been busy, can't you? But she said a very interesting thing. She said, when I was at the auditorium, she would tell me the name of the auditorium. She said, you came down the aisle and you just laid your hand on the top of my head. And she said, I had cancer of the tongue. My tongue was half eaten off. And she said, I was instantly healed and the tongue grew back on and I've been meaning to write you for seven years. Now, would you believe that with a dramatic healing like that, wouldn't you think somebody would write you? But they don't. I mean, but I praise God because this means that they're giving the credit to God and they're not giving it to a human being because God won't share his glory. Hallelujah. So I didn't hear from this girl, didn't hear anything about it. Of course, there are thousands of people that we never hear from. And I praise the Lord for those that we do hear from. But... Um, about six months later, we were in Beaumont, Texas, and a lady came running up to me and she said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. She said, I'm the person that you laid hands on that day down there in Galveston. Remember, I had that friend that was dying, and I said, when she, t when she said that, she said, I was the first one in line. I instantly remembered who it was, and, and she said, would you like to know what happened? How many of you know what I said? How many of you know I can always tell by the way they ask me that, that it's good? Oh, I just knew this was gonna be good. And I said, tell me what happened. I forgot to tell you what I did. When I finished praying, I did something I've never done all my life before, never done it since. I looked at my watch and I said, it's 1137. Never in all my ministry, when I have prayed for somebody, have I ever looked at my watch because I could care less what time it is. But I said to her, it's 1137. And so she said, would you have to me tell, what, tell you what happened? Yes. At 1137, she said, Jesus Christ, walked into this hospital room and he said, Shirley, get out of bed, you're healed. Now remember, this woman had been in a coma. She was under an oxygen tent. She unfolded the oxygen tent. <laughs> Pulled the needles out of her arm, got out of bed, stood up, do you have an idea what happened to the nurses? <laughs> One nurse came running. She was still on her feet. She came running and she said, Shirley, what are you doing out of bed? And she said at 1137, Jesus Christ walked into this room and he said, Shirley, get out of bed. You're healed. And the nurse said, why didn't you call me? She said, he didn't tell me to call you. <laughs> He just told me to get out of bed. And Shirley was dismissed from the hospital the next day, totally, completely, positively, and forever healed of cancer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, there is power in intercessory prayer. That's why when somebody says to me, will you pray for Uncle Joe over here or whatever it is, I pray as fervently as if Uncle Joe was there right now because there is power in intercessory prayer. When you ask the Spirit of God to move anywhere in the world, I believe that God hears us. I believe that we can just gain access to the throne of God anytime we open our mouth and we say in Jesus' name. All right, now, healing through prayer cloths. That's another real, real exciting subject. This is chapter 11 in the book, How to Heal the Sick. In Acts 19, 11 and 12, it says God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. I believe if it happened to Paul, it can happen to you and it can happen to me. If it happened 2,000 years ago, it can happen today, and it is happening today. 
People are being healed of all kind of diseases and demons are departing when you send them a prayer cloth. Now we send out many from our office. As a matter of fact, I just brought in a whole sack of them this morning uh, from our house because people write to us and they ask us to send them a prayer cloth. There is power in a little piece of cloth once it has been anointed by a spirit-filled person, up until that time, there is nothing in a little, we just sent out a little piece of polyester. They're like, two, we're scriptural. We send them out two by two. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus sent them out two by two, so we cut them two inches by two inches, and we send them out. But you see, I believe that Brother Paul had no more power in his body than you have and I have. We have the same Holy Spirit power. Amen? All right. He didn't have any more of it than we do, did he? Nope. Because to each one of us is given the Holy Spirit. We are not given a portion of the Holy Spirit. We are given the Holy Spirit when we receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So he had no more power than you or I. Therefore, when something touches your body, it becomes just as anointed as it did Brother Paul's. There is a difference. You see, if you believe, it has a lot of difference. You see, it makes a lot of difference. I believe that when I touch something, it's anointed by the power of God. Now that's through faith that I believe that. Now you see, I want your faith to be so strong that you can say, if Francis Hunter can lay hands on things and they're anointed, then I lay hands on them and they're anointed too. Amen? Well, we have a very interesting story, and this is probably one of my favorite, although we've had many, many on prayer cloths. A lady in England read about the anointed prayer cloths that we send out from our ministry. And by the way, we do not charge for them. I always have a little hesitation when somebody says, send me $10 and I'll send you an anointed prayer cloth. Send me nothing and I'll send you an anointed prayer cloth. Well, uh, so we send them out from the office all the time and we just pray and we believe for miracles and we see miracles as a result. But uh, we also see tremendous salvation miracles as a result of little prayer cloths because I believe that a prayer cloth can just contain, contain the power of the Holy uh, Spirit to convict, to heal, to cast out devils. It can just do anything. But this one particular one I want to tell you about because uh, a lady in England, a grandmother, had just had a baby and the baby was born with a water head. You know what that is? One of those real big super heads, born with a water head and it had no hip sockets. It was born with a congenital hip problem. And they, she, this grandmother wrote to us and she said, uh, I just have read about your prayer cloths and, and I've heard about the healings that occur from those prayer cloths that you send out. Would you send me one? And so we got our whole staff together. We just laid hands on that and we just believed. And then I wrote a letter and I put the prayer cloth on the inside of the letter Put it in an envelope. Now I want to show you what happens when you do something like, when you mail a letter. We never realize how many steps it goes through, and I didn't either until we sent this prayer cloth out. But it went from my desk, probably to a secretary's desk. From there it went to the mail room, went through the postage meter, from there, it went to the local post office. We were on the other side of town at this time. It went from the local post office to the downtown post office. From the downtown post office, it went to the airport post office. From the airport, it jumped on a plane and probably went from Houston directly to New York. In New York, that little letter containing the prayer cloth got off the plane and had to get on another one to go to probably London, England. All right, now look at how many hands handled this particular piece of mail. And then when it got to London, I'm not real sure where Failsworth is, but I imagine it had to either go on a plane or a bus or a train or something like that. Eventually got to the post office in Failsworth, England. From there, it was taken, it was sorted through all the mail that came to that town until it finally was picked up by the local mail carrier who took it to the grandmother. Now, I'm telling you this long-winded story for a very good reason. The anointing does not fall off of a piece of cloth. 
In other words, once you lay hands on it for the anointing of God to go on it, just because you send it over the, over the Atlantic Ocean, it doesn't mean that the ocean is going to suck the power of it out as it goes over. It doesn't mean that every time it changes hands, there goes the power of God. I believe when something is anointed, it is permanently and eternally anointed. So it finally, eventually, ends up in Failsworth, England, in the hands of this sweet grandmother. And she happened to be babysitting that day with her grandbaby. And the baby was asleep. And so she took this prayer cloth and she placed it in between the thumb and the forefinger of this little baby that was asleep on his tummy, you know, with his hands out like that. Grandma put it in there. And when she did, the water head went and the baby was instantly healed. No more waterhead. Now some few weeks later, they took the baby back to the clinic where the baby had been delivered and where the baby was being treated and they bawled her out. Oh, they really got mad at her. And do you know why? They said, what are you doing bringing this baby here? This isn't the same one we've been treating. This baby has no waterhead and this baby has two perfect hips and the child that we were treating had no hip sockets at all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I tell you, that letter that we received from that grandmother is one of the things that we treasure to this day because if anything ever made me believe in the power of a prayer cloth, that did. Now, I want to share another story. We began to, we were at a, a meeting one time and uh, we used to carry prayer cloths with us all the time when we were on the bus with the Amigos and we didn't have to worry about having to carry things along with us. Since Charles and I travel, just the two of us now, luggage becomes a problem once, a, uh, once in a while because when you've written 39 or 40 books, however many we've written, you, and you'd, even if you just took 10 along of each one, do you realize how many books you end up carrying? So as a result, we have to limit some of the luggage that we take along. One of the things that we stopped carrying with us was prayer cloths. But I was sitting back at the back table one day and a, a lady came up to me and she said, um, do you have any of those prayer cloths with you? And I said, no, we don't. And she said, oh, she said, I wanted you to lay hands on something because, and she told me her need. So I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I believe that you can anoint a piece of Kleenex. I don't think it may, it has to be a piece of cloth. I said, do you have a Kleenex we'll lay hands on? So she said, yes. Well, I just finished doing that and another lady came up and she said, do you have any prayer cloths with you today? She said, uh, I have, and I said, no, I don't. So we go through the same routine again. And I said, do you have a Kleenex? Yes, well, I said, well, we'll just lay hands on that Kleenex because I believe that the power of God's Holy Spirit can go, can go into that too. The third person came up and who knows what they said. Do you have any prayer cloths? No. I said, God, are you speaking to me today? I really, how many of you know that you get the idea once in a while that God is telling you to do something special? So I said, I just have a feeling in my spirit that God is telling us that there are people here today who want something anointed to place on somebody else. And so at the end of teaching on prayer cloths, I said, now, I just believe that there are a lot of you from what the Spirit has said to me who want to have something anointed for a special purpose. And I had also told them about many husbands are saved when a wife takes a prayer cloth and puts it under his side of the bed and the Holy Spirit power of God begins to move. That husband shakes, rattles, and rolls. Believe me, <coughs> when the Holy Spirit power begins to move in that bed, I doesn't really probably shake, rattle, and roll. But in other words, the Spirit of God can go through a prayer cloth and uh, they, they can be, and a person can be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, my faith, is so simple. I just think God can do anything. A man brought a pair, a woman brought a pair of sheets and she said, would you, ask, that's a big piece of cloth to anoint. Isn't it? She said, would you ask God to anoint this? She said, my husband is such a rotten, stinking sinner. She said, do you believe that God could heal him if he laid on, I mean, if he could, God could save him if he laid on anointed sheets? I said, honey, I believe God can do anything. And I'll tell you, old Charles, I laid hands on those old sheets and we just prayed that resurrection power to go in there. And I said, Father, when he lays on those anointed sheets, may he be so convicted by the Spirit of God he just can't stand it. Six 
nights later, her husband came to our meeting and he said, I couldn't stand it. He said, there was something so awful on those sheets. He said, I could not sleep at night. And he said, I kept getting more miserable and more miserable and more miserable. And he got saved as a result of sleeping on anointed sheets. So I said, whatever you got. I said, now, I don't believe it makes any difference. I said, I believe that when you lay hands, God can anoint anything. How many of you believe God's sovereign and he can anoint anything? So I said, all right. I said, I said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I said, I want, I want you to look in your pocketbooks. I said, bring a scarf, bring a handkerchief, bring anything that you want. And I said, we'll believe God to anoint it. So they came up and it's amazing how clever people are. Did you know that? It's really amazing how clever they are because uh, several of them brought up their checkbooks. And they brought, up their, uh, they brought up their pins so that they could write anointed checks. Well, I think that's a real good idea. And we had some lady bring up um, chewing gum for her unsaved children. Just ask God to let the Spirit of God go in that chewing gum. And when they began to chew it, they'd see a miracle. Now, don't laugh. You know what? Nothing is impossible to God. You see, we all go around saying, nothing is impossible to God. Nothing is impossible to God. Nothing is impossible to God. But do we really believe it? I do. I just think nothing's impossible to God. That's why I pray for the silliest things. Well, so here they're all, they're all standing around. And, and there was a line that went all the way back down the center aisle. And way at the back, there was a real white-haired lady. And uh, she had something that I didn't recognize in her hand. So I'm going... I was trying to figure out what she had in her hand. And I never could, I knew what I thought it looked like, but I thought, well, I better find out. So I said, that last lady back there, I said, um, what do you have in your hand? She said, a dollar bill. She said, do you think God could anoint money? Can God anoint money? Yes. Do you think the power of God could go into dirty, filthy lucre? Do you? So do I. <laughs> so she said, I have a grandson in prison. And she said, he will not read a book. He will not read a track. He wouldn't read a Bible. But she said, he loves money. He loves money. She said, do you believe that God could save him through a dollar bill? I said, you better believe I do. And so she came up. And I tell you, we laid hands on that old dollar bill and we claimed that grandson's salvation. I had the privilege some two months later, Charles, I'm not real sure what the time element was there, of standing at the back of this very auditorium where you're sitting. And a very handsome, redheaded young man came in and he said, Mrs. Hunter, I want to thank you for having such simple, childlike faith. And I thought, well, that's nice. I probably prayed for something for him. You only got it. And he said, do you remember the grandmother that was in your service that had a dollar bill? And you said you believe that God could anoint money? I said, I sure do. And how many of you know what was beginning to happen? There were little wheels beginning to churn in my head. He said, I'm the grandson that she said it to. And he said, do you know, he said, the most amazing thing happened. He said, when the letter came and I opened it up, the dollar bill fell out. And he said, I grabbed for it. And he said, when I grabbed for it, something happened to me. He said, I don't know what happened, but he said, all of a sudden at the top of my yelled lungs, I yelled, somebody get the chaplain. Somebody get the chaplain. I've got to get saved. I've got to get saved through a $1 bill. I tell you, from that day to this, wherever Charles and I have a healing seminar, we do just this, and we've had some of the most tremendous things happen. As a matter of fact, in one of our recent services in St. Louis, Missouri, somebody brought a can of grape juice 
for the next service and they said, you know, I couldn't think of anything that this I could do to this person. It was not somebody who lived in their house, but they do love grapefruit juice. So would you anoint this can of grapefruit juice? And I'll tell you, we laid hands on that old can of grapefruit juice. A fireman came in, uh, in a volunteer fire department. He's the only Christian in the whole place and so they have the jackets apparently that, in other words, the jackets are just there and I guess they're all the same size. And so you grab them and he said, would you anoint this jacket so that whoever wears it will be aware of the presence and the power of God? And so we just anointed. And I'm excited when I see people just think of impossible things for God to anoint. When we were up in Alaska a few years, a couple of years ago, I tell you so many, this was just before Christmas, there were so many girls brought us hundred dollar bills and they said, would you anoint this because I'm going to give it to my unsaved husband for Christmas. You have no idea how many men got trapped <laughs> because they took money from their wives as a Christmas gift. I, tell you, I don't believe that we ever had as many letters from any place as we did after that Christmas, these husbands who felt the anointing of God through these uh, anointed $100 bills. Now, I'm going to see how clever you students are this morning, and I'm going to see how clever you guests are this morning. I want you to do this. How many of you have somebody that needs to be healed or needs to be saved or needs a miracle from God? You raise your hand, all right? Now I want you to look in your pocketbook. I want you to look in your shoe. I mean, uh, you can just have any, I just think you can have anything anointed. So I want you to do this. I want you to come forward and I want you to bring whatever you're going to give to somebody else. Now remember, if you bring money to be anointed this morning, don't you dare spend it. Although you know what I do? I lay hands on all my money. Whenever, I, whenever Charles puts money in my pocketbook, whenever Charles puts money in my pocketbook, you know what I do? I lay hands on it. I say, Father, may the grocery clerk I give this to or the cleaner that I give this to, may they just get such a charge of the Holy Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, our office is instructed for all offerings in the ministry and for all the money that comes into the ministry during the week that we, that they are to anoint it in the name of Jesus. Now, can you imagine if every church in the United States did that same thing? Can you imagine what would happen? to the bank tellers on Monday morning. Oh, they'd get all these offerings and they'd just get shaken all over the place. You see, I believe it, we're, we just get so complicated, we get so sophisticated that we can't go back to simple little principles. And I believe if we'd go back to simple little principles, we'd see the world one to Jesus before we could ever imagine. Come on, start bringing your things up here. I want to see how clever you are. Oh, you want them to face the camera. All right, you face the camera. Come up here and turn around because we want the camera to see something. Some of the things that you've got. Well, over here, I see she's got some. Boy, you got, boy, look at her. She's got that whole bunch of money up there. Here, we've got somebody that's going to write some anointed letters. Hold that up. She's got a pen. All right, come bunch up up here in the front, would you? Okay, now here's a pen we're going to do. What have you got there? What are those tickets for? What is that? Those are business cards. Now, there is a smart. Please, now, now come up here. All right. Come up, bunch up in front, okay? All right, she's going to have her business cards anointed. Do you know what's going to happen when she hands out those business I can just some, see somebody falling out under the power of God when you hand them an anointed business card. Oh, you see, she's a tax consultant. Can't you just see some of those people coming up there? All right, wait, there's some business cards over there, and she's got a wallet. All right, for her mystery, she's got a wallet. There's a pen over there. Lift them up high so that I can see them. Free admission. Now that is, are those into the kingdom of heaven? Those are little Bible tracts. There's some pictures over there. There's a pen over there. There's, a, well, we got some dollar bills there. Let's see what we've got over here. Let's just see what we've got over here. Charles, let's just bring them closer to the camera, okay? Because they're outside, I believe, of the- Lectures oh, from you. <laughs> lectures, all right. She's gonna have those notes anointed that we're putting there. All right, we got a pen over there. Lift it up high so I can see. I just wanna see how clever you are. All right, we got money over there. We got business cards there. You got money there. She's got a handkerchief there. What kind of bottom is that one? It's real high. Yeah. Let's see. In a white dress. What's that's Kleenex. Oh, that's Kleenex. All right. 
I know you've all heard of Schambach's story about praying for the girl who was insane with the candy. Hallelujah. And when she bit into the candy, ha! Her mind was healed. All right. Now, I'll tell you. Now, I want to tell you something else, too. Charles and I are not the only ones that have the power to lay hands on it. Who else has the power? We do. Oh, you're such a good bunch of students because you've learned that you have the same power. So what I'm going to do right now, we're going to pray. We're going to touch as many as we can. And then I want you students to cross over and you lay hands on those other, on the various things that everybody's got. I want everybody to have whatever they have here, laid, have hands laid on it by at least 10 other people. Boy, there's somebody's going to walk in anointed shoes. Glory to God. She's got her shoe up. Hallie, she's going to be healed through that anointed shoe in the name of Jesus. All right. All right. You know what? I have to tell you something funny. Just to show you how people do have imaginations, a lady brought to us the tiniest bikini one night that I've ever seen in my entire life. Pajamas, in case you know what I'm talking about. These little bitty things that you really have to look twice to see. And she said, do you think God could anoint them? Ha! How many of you know what I said? And I'll tell you what, you know what, if you want to give your husband a kiss that'll knock him off his feet, just ask Jesus to anoint your lips ha! for salvation power. Let me tell you this. God is sovereign and God can do anything. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for what you're doing in this school of ministry right now. I just thank you, Father, that we're having so much fun seeing all these exciting things anointed. Father, I just ask you to anoint this pen in the name of Jesus. Father, we just anoint that shoe. We just anoint that tablet in the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for these business cards in the name of Jesus. Let the anointing of God go out so that when people receive them, they'll get that salvation message. Father, oh, here we got a $20 bill. Somebody's going to get a $20 dollar bill. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you for that. I thank you, Father, for the anointing that's going to be in those checks. Thank you for the anointing that's on that book. Father, may that person as they, as they re whoever... How to Heal the Sick, Hour 6. Hallelujah. <laughs> I tell you, that Richard Thornhill is, is really uh, something. But you know, isn't the healing seminar exciting? Yes. Oh, I tell you. Now, you know what we're going to do at the end? We're going to say, go thou and do likewise. And that means to each and every one of you, we want you to go out there and to put into practice what you're learning here at the uh, healing seminar. If the body of Christ would just wake up to the fact that we have this power that's within us and we would just reach out and we would lay hands upon the sick and we would just uh, believe for miracles. You know, yesterday I saw a picture of a beautiful baby. I had laid hands on a girl a year and a half ago uh, who had never been able to have a baby. And I saw this most beautiful baby and the lady said, that's your baby, that's your baby. And I tell you, I just love it. I just lay hands on people for everything because I believe with God, nothing shall be impossible. And I think we ought to pray for everything. I tell you, if you, I'm going to pray for you too because she's going to have a baby. And I tell you, when I lay hands on them, they just slide out. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did I tell you about the, the um, uh, obstetrician up in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, who asked me to anoint his hands so that his babies would slide out. He said, I'll deliver the ones you've laid hands on. They just slide out. And he said, I want exactly that same thing. Nothing is impossible to God if we'll just pray and believe according to the Word of God. All right, I want you to open your book, How to Heal the Sick, to chapter 8, which is on page 93, Some Conditions for Healing. And I think it's very important that we know that there are some conditions for healing. But as I teach conditions for healing, I want you to also remember this. God is what? Sovereign. God is sovereign and he can do it any way he wants to. God can heal the wildest sinner. He can heal the, the dirtiest, nastiest sinner in the world. He can heal them sovereignly before they're saved. How many of you know that? Even though they have never complied with one condition of God, he can still sovereignly reach down and heal them. The reason I know is because we've seen it happen in many of our services. But then what happens when they get healed? They get saved. 
you're right. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's step number one, step number two, but this time, every once in a while, step number two comes first, you know. Now, there are, however, conditions under which if we live, and that was a complicated sentence that I just got myself involved in there, uh, we can discover that we will put ourselves in line for healing if we need to be healed, but I believe even more important than that, we put ourselves in line to walk in divine health. Now you see, God wants you to walk in divine health. How many of you believe that? He, God does not want you sick. God has made provisions for healing, but God's desire for you is that you walk in total divine health all the time. God is a God of our part and his part. You give God your best, God will give you his best. When you do your part, God will always do his part. I believe sometimes it's easier to heal a brand new baby Christian than it is somebody who has been healed or who has been saved for 20 years. And I'll tell you the reason for that. I think new babies have such simple little faith. They just believe, you know, oh, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And then many times after we've been Christians for many years, our faith is not quite on that keen edge that it was. But if we will line up our lives, and I'm saying that as a result of having prayed for hundreds of thousands of people, uh, that, uh, that, well, what happens after you've been a Christian a number of years, sometimes we let doubt and unbelief come in our lives. How many of you have ever let doubt and unbelief come into your life, even for a split second? Now we all have, all of us have. Well, so the thing that we need to do is to know what the conditions are for God's healing so that we can keep ourselves in divine health. God is a God of grace, mercy, and love. But the thing that we have to remember is that God is also just, and he has, to, uh, he has to conform to his word. If he said it, he has to fulfill it. Now, how many of you know that if we let, that, that God places discipline upon us? How many of you know that God is a disciplinarian? If you don't know it, you better find out in a hurry. God is a disciplinarian. As parents, how many of you are parents? All right. As parents, if you are not a disciplinarian, you are not a good parent. Amen? How many of you let your kids just run hog wild and do whatever they want to? I can tell you this. If you do, you got kids that are a mess. Now, you know the reason I know? Because I raised one before I was a Christian, one after a Christian. The one I raised before I was a Christian, you'd never believe the problems I had with him. I saw him do his own thing, and he did it. Hallelujah. But thank God, his word says, me and my house will be saved. And I stood on that scripture and saw my son saved. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The girl I had no, never had a problem with simply because she became a Christian 30 days after I did. And uh, she's almost as old as her mother is in the Christian walk. But uh, I asked her one day, I said, honey, what was the thing that made you accept Jesus? And she said, when I saw what a change it made in you, when I saw. So you see, your life can be a light to somebody else, even in your own family. She saw the tremendous difference that it made. If we let children eat what they want to, how many of you know that your kids would eat nothing but candy? You're right. Or maybe a French fry once in a while or something like that. <laughs> but you see, we have to be disciplinarians. And how many of you have forced your children upon occasion to eat a vegetable that they didn't like? Because we know that vegetables are good for them. You're right. And how many of you have taken candy away from them? Because you know it's not good for them. That's right. And so we need to discipline our children. And by the same token, God has to discipline us. Malachi 4.2 from the Living Bible says, But for those who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Did you see a condition in there? For those of you who fear my name. Two kinds of fear. Fear that comes from the devil, which is bad. 
and we do not need to have fear of any kind. But there is a fear that's good. And what kind is that? The fear of the Lord. How many of you fear the Lord? I tell you, I'd be afraid not to do what God told me to do. And you want me to tell you something else? I'd be afraid to do something that was out of line with His Word too. Because I tell you, you better fear the Lord. But you know, fearing the Lord is really respecting Him and loving Him. It really is. You see, because what he's doing, he's laying down guidelines which are for your own good. And if you fear, and another word for fear there is really respect. If you respect him, you're not going to go outside of those guidelines that he gives you. All right. Uh, I just want to give you a little example of God healing a sinner. One night we had a bartender come to one of our uh, services, and um, uh, he was in the balcony. I'll never forget this as long as I live because when he told us the story afterwards, it was so interesting. He's sitting there and he's saying, what a bunch of fakes. Oh, what a bunch of fakes these people are. Well, they just paid all these people to come up and tell them that they're healed and they're not healed at all. I don't believe anything that they're saying. So he just goes carrying on, carrying on like that. And Charles got a word of knowledge. And the word of knowledge is a, val is a valuable tool so far as the sinner is concerned. Charles pointed right directly at this man of course, he didn't know he was pointing at him. He said, somebody right there has got a big tumor under your arm and God just healed you. And a man let out a scream from the balcony. The guy that had been saying they're a bunch of fakes because he had a big tumor under his arm, which was so painful that he was having to hold his arm out like this. And when Charles pointed at him, it was like he shot an arrow at him and it hit the tumor and the tumor went shh. And the guy's arm went right down. Let me tell you this, that guy got out of the balcony. I think he almost jumped over. He, I mean, he just w turned in, into a, it was amazing what happened to him. He just came running down there and he said, I was an agnostic, but I'm not now. You see how God will heal a sinner but you see, God looks at that heart too and God says, you know, that's all he's got to do is get healed and watch him, he's going to get saved. Well, it was real exciting. Proverbs 3, 5 is a scripture that I quote again and again and again to people who come to me in a healing line. Many people who come forward for healing say to me, Oh, I'm such a nervous wreck. I'm just such a nervous wreck. I worry and worry and worry and worry and worry all the time. If you are a worry wart, the answer to you is Proverbs 3, 5. I especially like it in the Amplified Bible. It says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your mind and heart. Now, this is a condition of God to walk in his pattern for divine health. He says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. Does it say only on Sunday? Does it say to trust him on Monday too? How about Wednesday? Tuesday? Thursday? Saturday? Oh, not on Saturday. How many of you think you ought to trust the Lord every day in the week? You're absolutely right. It says, lean on him, trust in him, and be confident. And that confident is actually believe. In other words, believe that what God is saying is true. Believe in your heart that God wants you to walk in divine health. I believe that all the time. I don't believe that God wants me to be sick. I believe God's perfect will for me is that I walk in divine health until the day that Jesus comes and raptures me and I go to heaven. I believe when I go to heaven, I'll be bursting with divine health. I really do. All right. Lean in, trust on, trust in, be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. Don't do it half-heartedly. As I say to you over and over again, the, the Word says, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. If I were going to be a halfway Christian, you know what I'd be? I'd be a sinner. There's nothing that's more miserable than a halfway Christian because the Holy Spirit of God convicts you every time you do something wrong and you never really have the joy of the Lord in your heart because you're constantly plagued with guilt. Never do anything half-heartedly for the Lord. Give it everything you got. And I guarantee you, when you give it everything you've got, God will give you everything that he's got to. Trust him with all your heart and mind. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Sometimes our intellect can get in the way. 
How many of you have a good intellect? If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to get mad at you. Why do you have a good intellect? You have the mind of Christ. There you go. All right. But you see, I want to tell you this. Sometimes we can depend on the education that we've had. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not against education. I think it's great. But sometimes we depend upon what we have been taught by non-Christians to give us the instructions for life. Should we do that? No. It says, lean not on your own insight or understanding. And look at the rest of that. It says, in all, in every way, everything that you do, in all your ways, know, recognize, and acknowledge him. And he will direct and make plain your paths. If you will trust him in every area, God will direct your path. He said, the steps of a good man or a righteous man are directed by the Lord. Remember that. God wants to direct your steps. But what happens or why occasionally do we walk other than the way the Lord intends for us to? Because we're doing our own thing. We're out there doing our own thing. But if you want to walk in divine health, you better line up yourself with the Word of God. He says, in all your ways, know, recognize, and acknowledge Him, and He will direct and make straight and plain your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Don't be wise in your own eyes. I'm smart only because I have the mind of Christ. In my own natural ability, I'm not smart. But I'm smart because I possess the mind of Christ. I give God glory. The, I give God the glory for everything that I do. I have given God the glory for every book that I have ever written because in the natural, I have no ability to write a book. None. None whatsoever. And yet God has given us one anointed book after another one because we give him all the glory and all the praise. I can absolutely take no credit for it whatsoever because there are times when I've sat at a typewriter typing a book and when I finish the page, I rip it out of the typewriter and I say, Charles, look what God said. Isn't this really neat? And I'm so amazed at what my own fingers have typed on a page. It has to be the ability of God when you trust on him and you're not wise in your own eyes. Reverently fear and worship the Lord and turn, listen to this, it's a condition, turn entirely away from evil. Entirely. Not partially. Entirely away from evil. All right, and then look what he says. He gives you all these admonitions, and then he comes in with a goodie. And the goodie says, it shall be health to your nerves and sinews and marrow and moistening to your bones. Now, moistening to the bones concerns arthritis. It's when your bones get brittle and, and, and when you have an excess of calcium in there and the marrow in your bone is not functioning properly, this is when you have a tendency to get arthritis. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who has arthritis does not trust the Lord. But did you hear what this said? You see, it says, trust him, be confident in him, recognize him as your source, and it will be healing to those arthritic joints and nerves. I believe that the greatest cure in the world for arthritis is to get bitterness out of your life, to get worry out of your life, and trust God. Like Charles and I say, God, this is your ministry. If you want to go down the drain, let it go down the drain. But he doesn't do it. But see, I shove it all back on him. I say, it's yours, it's yours. And then I put all the footwork with it that is necessary. You cannot expect the best from God unless you give your best to God. Now, I say that over and over to students every year. I, we say that over and over again in all the cities where we teach. You cannot expect the best from God unless you give the best to God. But when you line up your life with the Word of God, 
you can expect the Word of God to line up with your life. Sometimes you look at people and you think, why do all those good things happen to them? Because they're lining up their life with the Word of God. When you line it up, you just put yourself in a position to receive all the good things of God. All right, he tells us to turn away from evil. Who has to turn away? Does God turn you away? No, you have to do it. If you've got something in your life that you know is not pleasing to God, you're the one that better dump it. You're the one that next time you go over the bridge out there, throw it out in the river. Hallelujah. Now, uh, we've been blessed. I've been blessed more than Charles in the area of healing simply because he wasn't the dirty, nasty, rotten, stinking sinner that I was before I got saved. As he always says, he was that sweet sinner. Hallelujah, I was the nasty one. But before I got saved, I had Addison's disease, which is a fatal disease. I was taking 19 grains of thyroid every day, and I took it for years. 19 grains of thyroid is enough to blow the roof of your head off. Did you know that? The average person, if they take one grain of thyroid, is ready to shitty up a wall because it makes you so nervous. I took 19 grains day in and day out to keep myself uh, going. And then even at that, I could be sitting at the office and I would just fall off my chair on the floor, sound asleep. I was widowed and I had two children and I had to work. And I'd sit there and I'd go right off of the chair. And sometimes it would be two days before I would ever wake up again. And the most amazing thing happened. Talk about God healing a sitter. The day I got saved was the last day I ever took a grain of thyroid. And the funny thing is, I didn't, even know I, I didn't even know I got healed. I just forgot to take the thyroid. And probably six months afterwards, I thought, what happened to that Addison's disease I had? I was so excited about Jesus, I totally forgot. And I was trusting him for everything. I forgot that the doctors had told me I wasn't going to live very long. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, you know, Charles, I just remember they told me I wouldn't, I'd be pushing up daisies in about two months. Hallelujah. How many of you think I made it? I've been saved for 17 years. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, that's not the reason that I got saved. That's not the reason I got saved at all. I mean, that's an amazing thing because I wasn't even thinking about that when I got saved. But that's just one of those little byproducts that God does for you. All right, let me show you another conditional promise of God. He says, in Psalms 128, in the Living Bible, it says, Blessings, blessings, blessings on all who reverence and trust the Lord, on all who obey Him. You obey God, beloved, and I'm going to tell you this, God's blessings will flow and flow and flow and flow upon you. You get out of being obedient to God, and <clears throat> let me tell you this, you're going to pay a price. And there is a price that we pay. How many of you know that there's a price you pay for sin? Sin is fun for a season, even, even the Bible says so but there's a price that you pay. I smoked for 35 years. You've all heard me tell, give my testimony. I smoked for 35 years, five packages a day. The thing that it did to my system was that it, uh, it ruined my circulatory system. And for many, many years, I had real problems with my legs. I praise the Lord, I don't have them with anymore. Hallelujah. But there is a price that you pay, pay for sin. And in just a few minutes, I'll tell you a very interesting story on that. Now, I praise God that uh, they tell me, after seven years of not smoking, your lungs are totally cleared up again. They were, they're, they're really full of black goo and, and uh, you know, all that tar from tobacco. And they say it takes seven years for them to get cleared out. And I praise the Lord. So many people die from cancer of the lungs that have smoked as much as I did but I have the most beautiful clear lungs today you ever saw in your whole life, hallelujah, 17 years without a single solitary cigarette. Okay, in the Living Bible, Psalm 128 goes on to say, their reward for obeying the Lord, how many of you believe you get rewarded when you obey the Lord? Oh, yes, he does. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God rewards those who diligently seek him. Okay, it says, and their reward for obeying the Lord will be prosperity and happiness. How many of you think that's a pretty good reward? There you go. Okay, it says, now look at these specifics. Your wife shall be contented in your home. How many of you believe that the discontent in homes today 
is caused for the most part because people are not obeying the Word of God. They're not obeying the Word of God. They're not obeying the Word of God, so you can't claim this wife. Think your wife shall be contented in her home. And look at all those children. They shall sit around the dinner table as vigorous and healthy as young olive trees. That is God's reward for those who reverence and trust Him. Charles and I were so blessed at Thanksgiving to have all of our children and all of our grandchildren down here. And we quoted that verse of Scripture as we looked at our seven beautiful grandchildren, healthy as can be. None of them have a problem wrong with them of any kind. And I said, oh, thank you, Lord. That's just one of the blessings of trusting and obeying God is being able to see those beautiful children out there. God's going to reward you with happiness, a long life. He's going to reward you with health. He's going to reward you with prosperity. He's going to reward you with a joy that is just bubbling over that you absolutely cannot contain. I want you to go to Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. No, let me back up. No, I'll give you this one first, okay. Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. He said... No, the kind of fast I want for you is to stop oppressing those who work for you and treat them fairly and give them what they earn. I want you to share your food with the hungry and bring right into your own homes those who are helpless, poor, and destitute. Clothe those who are cold and don't hide from relatives who need your help. If you, need, if you do these things, God will shed his glorious light upon you. He will heal you. Your godliness will lead you forward, and goodness will be a shield before you, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Hallelujah. Did you hear what that says? It says if you line up your life with the word of God, God will heal you. You. I have often thought about how many times Charles and I have so many people in our houses. Our house, we have to, we had all of our sofas made so that they can turn into beds. And I'll tell you, we just had people bedded down all over our house. And I just praise the Lord because that's a scriptural principle. Did you know that? As a matter of fact, there are times when Charles and I are out of town that we have people stay at our house. Hallelujah. When, they, when the visiting evangelists come in, they stay at our house. We give them a key, give them a car. But you know God bless us because we do. You know, if, we, if you're willing to share what you've got, God will bless you. All right, Exodus 15, 26 in the Amplified. Now here's another uh, point, uh, another passage that stresses the same point. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do right, what's right in His sight and will listen to and obey His commandments and keep all of His statutes, then He says, I'll put none of these diseases upon you which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. He said, you do my word, you work the works of God, and God will pour out his blessings upon you in greater ways than you ever dreamed. I look at some of our students at the School of Ministry who have graduated one, two, or three years ago, and I can always pick out the ones who have lined up their lives with the word of God because I see the blessings of God just overtaking them and overcoming them. People who are out there and who are now pastoring successful churches. This just thrills me when I see these kids who came in here one I'm thinking of came in here was even on dope the day he started his school. But God got a hold of his life. And I'll tell you, he's out there diligently serving the Lord with everything he's got. And we see these kids prospering. We just, and I'll tell you, not all of them are young either. So some of our, well, our, I guess our president last year was 70 what, Charles? 74, something like that. I mean, that they weren't babies. But God is blessing these people who are lining up their lives with the Word of God, just like He's going to bless each and every one of you. Because if you, don't, if you sit here day after day and you don't learn to line up your life with the Word of God because of what we teach you, I'm going to take you all out to the spiritual woodshed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. But He says, I'll he I'm the Lord that heals thee. But you, did you notice that He puts that promise on at the end of the conditions? The conditions are there, and you better obey the conditions of God if you want to receive the blessings of God. We all like the blessings. How many of you know that? While we all like money, we all like new cars, we all like new homes, we all like all those good things of life, and God will give them to you, providing you do all the things that he says. Okay, here's another one. Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great that there shall not be room enough to receive it. 
and then go on because most people stop there. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And I have to tell you a story about that in conjunction with healing because every, every word that God puts in his Bible is important. We were in a meeting one time and uh, uh, a missionary came all the way from some foreign country and brought his two children who had been stricken with muscular dystrophy. And my natural instinct is to go and to lay hands on them and to cast out that foul, evil spirit. <clears throat> but this was in a church that was packed out. And as I walked down to him, God said to me, ask him if he tithes. Now this is a missionary. We all assume that all pastors tithe. We all assume that all evangelists tithe. As a matter of fact, we all assume that all Christians tithe. But how many of you know they don't? Can I tell you something? The Christians who don't tithe are the ones who are walking in poverty. You show me the Christian who tithes, and I'll show you a Christian who's walking in the blessings of God. So I said to this missionary, remember in front of like 1,300 people, something like that, I said, I'm sorry, but before I lay hands on your children, I have to ask you a question. Do you tithe? He said, I have tithed ever, from the day, ever since the day I got saved. I said, glory. Ha! I said, now I'm going to stand on a verse of Scripture that's different. I'm going to stand on the Scripture that says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. I said, your children are the fruit of your vine. And if you tithe, there's a scriptural principle there. God is not going to let the devourer have him. And so I cast out that foul spirit on the strength of that scripture because this man told me he tithed. And I want you to know that little girl got out of bed the next morning. We saw them the next day. She got out of bed that morning for the first time in years all by herself because her mother and daddy had tithed. She was totally and completely healed because of a promise of God that he will not let your fruit be cast from the vine before their time. Let me tell you this, if we just understand all those good conditions to God, we would apply it, we would use them more often. Okay, I want to turn you over, I want you to turn over to just a, a little tiny chapter on other ways to heal the sick, and Charles is going to come and help in this one too. As a matter of fact, he's going to do most of the teaching in this one, but Faith in action is something that we have talked about, I think, yesterday. This is chapter 12 on page 115 in the book, How to Heal the Sick. There you go. Okay. Matthew 12, 10 and verses 13 are real important because it is so important when we lay hands on the sick to make the sick do something. Because many times, if they don't put their faith into action, they will lose their healing. We have seen people lose their healing because they did not instantly do what one of God's servants told them to do. This is Jesus, and it says, And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. Then saith he to the man, this is Jesus speaking, Stretch forth thine hand. And as he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, just like the other. Faith in action is a thing that you're going to have to start in the lives of other people. In other words, when you lay hands on the sick, the first time you tell somebody in a wheelchair to get, get up and walk, you know what you're going to be? Scared. How many of you believe that? Well, certainly you are. You're going to think, but if he doesn't get up and walk, oh, who cares? Don't worry about that. You do your part. But you see, you're going to have to cause that person to do some faith, to, to put some faith into action. That's just like Charles and I do at our services. We say, stretch forth your hand. And we have seen many uh, locked elbows unlocked. As a matter of fact, we just got a call, telephone call day before yesterday, I guess it was. Some of our students had been watching us teach a healing seminar and they were so excited because they began to operate uh, in their little group with a word of knowledge and one of the girls said uh, there's somebody here who's got a lump on their breast and a lady who was visiting said that's me and so she touched it remembering all the things that we said and laid hands on that the woman fell out under the power of God and her husband in the other side of the room fell out under the power of God at the same time but when the woman got up she did not have a lump 
on her breast. Hallelujah. Now, this is students. This is students just exactly like you. And then there was a man there who had broken his arm and he had a locked arm. And they had heard Charles teaching about a locked arm and putting faith into action. So they did the same thing that they said Charles did. They said, just rub your hand down there and say, in Jesus' name. They said, now stretch forth your hand. The man went, and his arm was instantly healed. This is students, and this is up to date because that was just a call that came in day before yesterday because people are beginning to learn that there are many, many different things that they can do. All right, I'm just going to briefly go into the story of the man who, uh, when, who was blind and Jesus uh, spit on clay and put it on his eyes and he said, now go walk to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes off. Now that man could have said, you have got to be kidding. I'm blind. How can I find the, the pool of Siloam? But when people will not do what you tell them to do, do you know that they never get healed? But when people are obedient, it's fantastic. I can just see this guy wandering down there saying, let me hit the pool of Siloam, let me hit the pool of Siloam. And he got down there and he washed it off of his eyes and he could see. Putting your faith into action or encouraging somebody else to put theirs in action when you have laid hands on them is one of the greatest ways in the world there is to get healed. The story of Naaman the leper is another tremendous one. You know, Elijah told him to go down and jump in the lake seven times. I often wonder if that's where we got that expression from, go jump in the lake, jump in the river is what he told him, though it wasn't really Charles jump in the river. You see, if Naaman had not been obedient, and that sounds dumb, doesn't it? To go jump in the river seven times and dunk yourself in all the expensive clothes that he had on. It was a muddy old river anyway, and he probably thought he had a better river at home. But he was obedient to a command for action. Now that was faith in action. He went down there when he dunked himself seven times, he was instantly healed of the leprosy. Putting faith into action, getting out of bed <coughs> when you have been sick, but knowing that you heard God and that a touch has come on you is a tremendous way. Charles, you want to come up and share uh, some of these? Maybe I better just share this one more about being under the power because that's another tremendous okay. way. Yeah. On, on being under the power, I want to demonstrate with you on that. Uh, there's, uh, do you want to share just a little bit on the story about that, what being under the power really is? And then we'll go ahead. Let me share that much, Evan. Praise the Lord. And then you tell a story if you want to. Uh, falling under the power of God is a way to get healed uh, because when you lay hands on somebody, the power of the Spirit of God in you is like a wind, is like a breath, and it will come out of you and it will go into somebody. And when God's power goes in, diseases can't stick around, you see. And so that's why they get healed. Now I'm going to step down to the front and I'm going to ask the camera to be alert. And I want somebody that really loves Jesus to come up and volunteer and stand right down here. Okay? Now, now, well, you can be the catcher, so stick around. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, now, don't back up. You guys, you have to quit re, uh, turning your back to the cameras. Uh, the students don't like backs. They Thank like fronts. The okay. Actor. Now, mm. let me tell you something. Here, I'm going to teach you something that probably occur. Uh, keep thy big mouth shut when I pray. Mm -hmm. Now, you listen because I already saw her. She's getting all excited. Jesus said she's getting excited, you see. Well, the reason we say keep thy big mouth shut when we pray is because it's in my Bible. It's not in yours. Way back in the back of mine, I wrote in there, keep thy big mouth shut. That's King James. Because you cannot be in one accord. You cannot transmit and receive at the same time. And when you got your big mouth shut open and I got mine open, you're not communicating with what I'm saying. You are off on your own little thing. So Jesus put it this way in the Bible. Be in one accord. You see, believe together. And that'll happen. Now, I want you to keep your big eyes open and a smile on your face. And I just want to demonstrate what happens when the power of God goes into somebody. The power is in you. It will flow out of you. You notice I'm standing close to her. The reason for that, as we explained before, the power of God goes out of me. You can feel it right now. You can feel that power. You see, it's coming out of me all over. It's not me. It's God's power doing that. But then generally you lay hands on the head. I generally very softly I didn't get to do it. God beat me to it. Isn't that neat? You see the power of God flowing out of you, every single one of you that have the power of the Holy Spirit in you that flows out like a wind. 
to the degree of the sensitivity of people to the Holy Spirit, that's the quickness of which they'll fall under the power or they will receive that. That also applies to healing. If you're being healed, if you're really sensitive, you really believe you're going to get healed, I mean, you, uh, the, the one doing the healing has hardly nothing to do. You just come up and pow, it happens. Well, that's what happens when you fall under the power. Now, one other little thing, We'll get into it in casting out demons. But a lot of times when somebody has a demon in them, they may be spirit-filled Christians, but the demon is not possessing them. The demon has just gotten in to try to control their mind. They're attacking them and so on. Uh, and many times we lay hands and pow, they're just, uh, they're just, uh, they're just like they're throwing them to the ground. Remember, they, they were thrown to the ground. Well, the demon is trying to do his part, but the power of God is so overwhelming that when the power of God goes in, people do get healed. Now, that's just a little simple demonstration of what falling under the power is and it uh, we would urge you if you don't have a catcher back them up to a bed also we would say isn't that neat let a bed be a catcher what we do a lot of times when we don't have a catcher we put them in front of a chair or a pew and let them fall back in the pew because God will work now that's just one of the ways that uh, you can heal the sick we're saying that don't try to put God in a box he isn't he doesn't fit a box. God is bigger than all the boxes put together. There's many ways to heal the sick, and God will show you ways that we've never heard of as we uh, share in this. Now, one time um, a lady came to us. Well, she had, we'd been in a meeting, and her husband was the president of the Full Gospel Businessmen. He had conducted the meeting, and his wife uh, was there, but she got all excited about things. She forgot to get prayed for herself. When she was born, she had a spinal bifida caudal. It's, a, it's like a missing spinal disc. Is that what it, a whole open spine? And uh, she had excruciating pain all of her life. Well, uh, when we got in the car for them to take us back to the motel, she said, oh, I forgot to get you to pray, and I've been in pain all this time. And we said, well, when we get to the motel, let's take care of it. And so we went into sort of a, a back corridor, but it was a lobby of the hotel, their motel. And so we just simply, Francis laid hands on her from the front, and I caught her. She fell under the power of God. And immediately when she hit the floor, she said, it doesn't hurt anymore. She got up, and the next day she already had a part growing back in and a missing part. We heard from her later. She's never had a problem since then, but the energy of God went into her when she fell into the power of God, and she was healed. Okay, now I'm going to, uh, Francis, come real quickly and tell them about uh, uh, barren women, or if you'd like to tell something uh, more on uh, falling under the power. Well, I tell you, I want to tell you a little bit about falling under the power of God. There are churches where this is a controversial subject, and people don't believe in falling under the power of God, but I know what happens when you fall under the power of God because I know what happened to me the first time Catherine Kuhlman ever laid hands on me. It totally revolutionized and changed my life. I had every hang up in the book on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. When I went on the floor, out the window, when every hang up I had on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But there is a power that goes into, I believe, every cell in your body when you are touched by the power of God. And one night at one of our uh, services up in Minneapolis, uh, a, a young girl had been brought from an insane asylum, a very beautiful young girl, but utterly and totally nutty as a fruitcake, if you know what I mean by that, utterly nutty. Now, uh, they had her, in order for her mother to get her out, they had to so heavily drug her that she was absolutely in a stupor. She does not remember anything that was said at the meeting whatsoever. And her mother literally drug her up at the end, and we laid hands on her, and she fell out under the power of God. She came back to one of our meetings um, a couple of years after that and testified. She said, I do not remember anything that went on at the meeting. I do not remember a single word that was said. But she said, the only thing I remember is lying on the floor, and I opened my eyes, and there stood Jesus Christ with his arms stretched out to me. And in that split second, she was saved. She instantly began to speak in tongues, and the spirit of insanity left her just like that. Today, she's the mother of three beautiful children, and she is as normal as you or I am. Now, that's what can happen under the power of God. You remember that lady we stopped by, Charles, and picked her up from a nut house that day? Man, we had to sign her out. 
And, uh, and we don't do this unless God specifically tells us to do it, but we had been requested to. And so we went and, and made ourselves responsible for this woman. But you know what we did? We brought back a sane woman that night when she went under the power of God. She is married today to a beautiful husband. We saw them the last time we were up in that area. And it's really beautiful. And the thing that did it is when she went under the power of God and that resurrection power went into every brain cell that she had and she was made totally and completely normal. Now. Uh, let me just do these very briefly before Charles goes in. One is on barren women. You know, the Word of God tells us over there in Psalm 113, 9, he said, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and be a joyful mother of many children. And then in Exodus 23, 26, it says, There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in the land. The number of thy days I will, will fulfill. In our new tabloid, we have a picture of some darling little twins. Their mother was hemorrhaging. And when I was there, I laid hands on her and I commanded that blood flow to stop. And that, that stopped because the word, I, I quoted this scripture, they shall not cast their young nor be barren in the land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. And she's got two of the cute little twins you ever saw as a result of somebody who believes the power of God. God's word says he makes the barren woman the joyful mother of many children. I'll tell you, I just lay hands on people all over the United States. Charles, I have little babies of all colors, black, yellow, green. You name, we went to China. Man, what an epidemic of little Chinese babies there was over there. We went to the South Pacific Island the hospital wasn't big enough to take care of all of the mothers when they came in. Hallelujah. But I tell you, anybody wants a baby, just see me and then we'll just take care of that. By the same token, the Word of God tells us that we are not like the Egyptian women. We are like the Hebrew women who had their babies much more quickly, it says. We're much more active. We're much more quickly. As a matter of fact, we have them even before the midwife gets there. Well, I lay, I lay hands on pregnant girls all over the United States and they all come back with the same report that they, I, and God gave me a, a figure, he said to just uh, ask and, and believe that they would be in labor less than three hours and that the baby would be delivered with no pain. And I'll tell you, we just have stacks of testimonies from girls that I've laid, laid hands on and my problem is I just believe it. See, I just believe it. I believe when you lay, I laid hands on you, that as soon as you get that hospital, that baby's gonna go right out there. Hallelujah. Y'all believe that? I'll let you learn to lay hands on them too and just believe. All you got to do is believe that scripture and stand on it and God will cause it to pass. Line up. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Come here. Oh, goody. I'm going to get to do it on camera. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When are you expecting, honey? In March. Well, all right. Okay, let me just. Okay. Hallelujah. Y'all believe with me? Father, your word. Oh, I just thank you for your, the word of God, Father. I just thank you, Father, that, is, that even now you'll give this little baby a shot of the Holy Spirit power of God. And this little baby is saying, hallelujah. Can you feel that little activity? And there he's going, hallelujah, hallelujah, because he's getting a shot of the Holy Spirit power of God. Now, Father, as soon as she gets to the hospital, oil the birth canal with the oil of the Holy Spirit and let a perfect, beautiful baby slide out in less than three hours with no pain to the mother. And I give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> that little old baby has been charged with the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> now you watch, that baby's going to have the peace of God upon its life. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, the next section we're going to teach on is uh, strokes. I'm going to try to abbreviate this. Uh, you can read it in a book, but you can also do it. It's a very, very exciting thing. And the way this came about, a man came up to me a few years ago. Uh, he had had a stroke. His, uh, he was paralyzed down his uh, right side, I believe it was, and his hand was all gripped up. It was white because of lack of circulation. The thumb was tied in. He could not move his arm. He could not move his leg. It was stiff. He had a person on either side of him. He was on two crutches uh, when he came up. He had not been able to speak for three years since he had had a stroke, and I never had uh, succeeded in getting people healed of a stroke. 
And so I was wondering how, but always unzip your mind, keep your spirit open for God to speak into your spirit while you're ministering healing. Because many times God will speak words into you how to do it. This time, it was not just a thought like uh, expression from God, but an energy came down, right, went through every cell right down into my chest area. And it was like my brain just opened up like a dilated and the Spirit of God spoke three words. He said, Spirit of death. Jesus called spirits by what they did. I just knew when God said it was a spirit that I had to cast out a spirit. It was not a disease, it was a spirit that caused it. And so immediately I laid hands on this man and I said, in the name of Jesus, devil, I bind you by the power of the Spirit of God. You spirit of death, come out. And when I did that, uh, the next thing God did was to give me a word of wisdom. Now it's an unusual one. I didn't know it was a word of wisdom. I just thought it was common sense. I'm not a therapist, I don't know a lot about that, but uh, the first thing I did was to say to this man, say, Jesus, I love you. Now his wife was standing there and knew all about this and she knew he couldn't talk. Hadn't for three years. But when I said, say, Jesus, I love you, he said, yeah, I love you. And she almost came apart, hallelujah, because he spoke. That wasn't real good, but he spoke. And then I went to his hand next and I said, move your hand. And he tried and it wouldn't budge. And so I took that hand, and the camera tried to catch this. I put one hand under his elbow. I caught the wrist with the other one. Someone come up here real quick and let me demonstrate this. be easier. Okay. Now this hand, it was, it was all like this, and this was hooked in. Put, open it up just a second. Put it in like this. Okay, now, now his hand was like that, and he couldn't move it. So I put a hand under his elbow. I caught him by the wrist, and I uh, just let it go a little bit. Now it was stiff, but I straightened it out all the way like that. And then I caught it and put my hand here and bent it all the way back and then back and back and it began to limber up. And uh, then I said to him, now you do it. And so his hand came something like this, came a little over and it came up like that. And I decided, well, I'll help him a little bit. Nurses have told me that God gave me a gift of therapy and he will you too. It's just some common sense. But I took it and I helped him just a little bit and I raised it up and raised it up and raised it up. And then I pulled it back down and I said, now you do it. And after two or three trials, he went up without my help. And that was the way it was. And then I took this finger and I pulled it out and I began to wiggle that thumb like that. And it began to limber up. And then I took his fingers and I worked them out and they began to limber up. And then he could open his hand. It was not all at one time. It took me maybe five or 10 minutes for this. And then I took his arm and I pulled it up like this because he has a joint up here that hadn't worked in three years. And I began to work that joint, stiff at first, and then began to free itself. And then I took his leg and did the same thing. I began to bend his knee. And as it began to work, uh, then that the healing started. And then he could do everything by himself within a five or 10 minute period. That man dropped both crutches, the people that were holding him up, and he walked away on his own power. We got a call back within three days and he was totally and completely healed of that. I think 90% of all evidence, he was talking normal, walking normal, using his hands normal. Uh, the other day we had a, a lady that had come about 400 miles to one of our meetings. She had had a stroke two or three years before. She was in a wheelchair. She couldn't, uh, she could talk some. She had uh, a little bit of a problem with her speaking and uh, uh, she couldn't bend her knees. Uh, she uh, had a problem in her foot. The whole thing, uh, yeah, the foot problem, she, it is a drop foot. You know, they don't, they don't have a way to uh, signal it, and so that foot just drops. Now, uh, when we minister to her, the same procedure, dealing with each part of the body. On the foot, I simply bent that foot, and I commanded all those, uh, uh, the nerves to go down and signal that uh, foot to be able to work. And I worked it a little bit, and she walked off normal. Uh, she really had faith. She was, I believe she was 100% healed. She came up in front, walked up on the stage, and testified with her hands out like that immediately when she was healed. Now, that's a simple way, but let me tell you what really happened. Happened. See, uh, I've asked doctors and nurses, what takes place when you have a stroke? And they say, well, it's a blood clot uh, in one of the arteries or vessels, and it stops the flow of the blood to a certain area of your brain cells. And because the blood can't get through, the oxygen and food supply of the blood can't get to that area of the brain, and the brain cells die. And that's why God called it a spirit of death. A spirit actually has an ability to do miracles. They're fallen angels. And, uh, and God never took that power away and they can actually do miracles. And so apparently what happens is that they have a way of clotting the blood, just stopping it up, making it come into a blood clot and stopping it. Sometimes it ruptures the vessel, sometimes it just blocks it. And I believe what happens, and I've had no medical scientific proof of this because we just haven't had a way to get it tested. I believe when you cast that spirit out, the spirit leaves 
and the, and the blood starts flowing and goes in. And at first, the brain cells, they've been dormant at least. I don't think you have to raise them from the dead, but if that's true, well, they, they'll get out from the dead. I don't know what takes place, but I do know that, uh, that all of a sudden, uh, where that uh, cells have died, there's nothing wrong with that arm. There's nothing wrong with that hand. There's nothing wrong with that tongue. There's nothing wrong with the leg. They're perfectly normal, but by gravity, they just draw up and are paralyzed because the brain cannot signal to that uh, part of the body. If you, uh, if you wiggle your finger like that, it's because your brain sends the signal down and your finger obeys it. Now, that finger can't do it if it can't get the nerve to tell it what to do. If the nerve doesn't tell a finger, it'll just sit there. Well, that's what happens when you have a, a stroke and it's uh, paralyzed. Now, what uh, nurses and doctors have told me in relation to this therapy, when that spirit's gone, the nerves haven't been activated. Your brain cells haven't been activated. And as soon as I told him to say, Jesus, I love you, uh, that brain cell had to send a signal to the tongue and his memory caught back and he started exercising his tongue just like an athlete begins to exercise. When I bent the arm, what was happening, I was moving the arm myself but it was causing an activation of the signals from the brain cell that hadn't been active. And so as soon as I moved that arm, the brain started sending signals. And as soon as I got the arm limbered up by therapy, then the brain could tell that arm to wiggle and it would. And that's a simple procedure for healing a stroke. Hallelujah. We got another section in that part of the book maybe we need to cover. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, well, thank you. Give Jesus a hand. Hallelujah. Oh, hay fever and sinus. I'll cover that one. Praise the Lord. Hay fever and sinus. Uh, I had hay fever uh, from the time I was a, a, a teenager until I guess when I was about 48 years old. Uh, it was very, very bad. Every type of thing that could happen through hay fever, it was awful. And my eyes would run and itch and my nose would run and itch and I had finally got ways to get two shots, a booster shot and such, and it would control it some. And then I had some pills that I uh, took that would actually control it to some degree. Uh, and it got to where, the, uh, well, finally I got healed of all of that. Uh, I was working for a, a, a millionaire, multi-millionaire in Houston. Uh, hay fever had been very bad, but I woke up one morning and God spoke to me. And he said, you won't need to take your pills this year. I'm going to heal you of hay fever. And so uh, this, to shorten that whole story, uh, I went into the CPA, into the office of this client, and my nose was running fiercely that morning. There's a whole lot more to the story, but my nose that particular morning was running fiercely. And this man, uh, he's a tremendous man, but he wasn't Holy Ghost filled, spirit filled, spirit filled Christian. And so he came into the office where I was working. My nose was running, my handkerchief was wet. And, uh, and the Spirit of God again came down on me and God said, get up and tell him you're healed. Well, that's kind of silly to tell your client that thinks you got good logic up here that you're healed when your nose is running. But I just stood up uh, by him and I said, God told me to tell you that he healed me of hay fever. This man had hay fever too. Well, from that point on, I've never had any hay fever, but I laid my whole CPA practice on, on the line. Well, later on, about 1977, I had had sinus some. It's very uh, related to that, but it's a different problem. Until 1977, sinus was so bad that I was going to a doctor at least once a month or every three weeks getting a shot. I was getting, taking three and four pills a day to try to control that. Other people got healed when we lay hands on them, but I couldn't. And so uh, after about a year of this, my throat was always sore from the, uh, from the drainage of sinus. It was a very bad situation to the extent I could hardly speak at times because of it. And one day I just said, God, tell me how to get rid of this junk. And we were visiting a medical doctor down in Florida. Uh, he and his wife had four children, teenagers. And, uh, and so Sue Fowler was preparing uh, lunch for us in their home. And she said, Francis, what would you like to drink? We don't have any coffee or tea in the house because uh, all of us were bugged with uh, sinus very badly for years. And we just all quit taking uh, coffee or tea and we started drinking juices. In two or three weeks, all the sinus left our family. And I said, thank you, Jesus. I've not tasted coffee or tea to this day and I have drunk a lot of juices and a huge amount of water, and I've had no more problems with sinus to this day. Occasionally, I'll get in smoke-filled rooms and a little bit of a problem come up. I don't hesitate to take one pill to stop it, just to, to reduce the, uh, the, you know, the drainage that starts, but one pill is about all I ever have to take. It's a beautiful miracle. Now, uh, one time, uh, uh, a, a singer, 
he was, uh, you know, he made recordings and all, and uh, he said that he got sinus real bad, it was draining his throat, and it was ruining his singing career. And so he went to a doctor about that, and he said, Doctor, I've got to get something to stop all this drainage. It's killing me. So the doctor got his prescription card. He wrote out the prescription, and the uh, young man looked at it, and he said, Doc, you've got to be kidding. All it said on that prescription blank was drink 14 glasses of water every day. He said, that'll make more sinus. It won't dry it up. And he said, no, try it. And he says, uh, sin uh, water is a diuretic. He drank it, and the sinus left him. So drink a lot of water if you want to get rid of it. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to cover just uh, in the last minute of time, mass healings. And uh, you'll see in a series that we're teaching, a mass healing series, but we often will line up people as many as 100 or more at a time that have a neck problem uh, or an elbow problem or a foot problem or a knee problem. And we simply uh, just go right down the line. The power of God strong in a miracle service will simply on a knee, I just simply squeeze the knees and I'll go right, maybe a hundred people, and they'll, most of them will fall under the power of God because of God, uh, the power goes right into those knees, and we'll see uh, many, many times, a hundred out of a hundred will be healed. They just uh, go right down the line because their faith is there, but one thing we do, we couple it back with faith and action. When I touch their knees, I've already instructed them, as soon as my hands touch your knees, the power is going to go in. That's what's going to heal you, but as soon as that power goes in, whether you fall under the power or not, you start bending your knees, faith and action, and when they bend their knees, they're healed, and we get them to run all over the place. Get